Okay. Uh, uh, broadly speaking, uh, most of what we were doing, uh, of course it was, it was related, but we were much more interested in the physical sides of things about what we now call sustainability. So this is one of a million different diagrams of something's happening. I mean, you can see that big <laughs> bit of a log scale. So, you know, there's just a million, there's something interesting is happening now, you know, in the last century, this century, and so on. So we know. So and we were sort of there at the beginning when the people were beginning to realise. And uh, uh, it did induce a kind of a panic. Um, um, basically, I, this is probably, I, I often, what, is this the basic insight of the environmental movement? Um, <laughs> there it is. Uh, we, we, we took that literally. It's interesting, the whole economics profession is dedicated to denying it and most of academia and all the political class and so on. But anyway, we believed it. We thought, uh, we naive kind of realism. <laughs> and it's corollary, you can't get a court into a pint pot. That's a <laughs> but anyway, um, one of the... Uh, Effects of that would, was was to this. This is a bit like the sort of bullet in the atomic scientist's clock. You know how many minutes to midnight, but sort of how many years have you got before you really uh, the shit's really going to hit the fan? And uh, just in, you can see the dates on, on there. after the war. Everybody, yeah, it's fine. Technology's all right. Gradually, we started to realise there was this downside to it, and it got worse and worse. And eventually, a tremendous apocalyptic mood had gripped us. Not much of the rest of the. Uh, radical science movement, but anyway, we were saying, look, you, you've got to turn everything around in 20 years. That led to uh, undercurrents, of which Godfrey was the editor, and eventually this book, Radical Technology, and I'd like to give a plug, we'll pass these things around. It. Next year, it's the 40th anniversary of this, and we're going to have a meeting, and, and people get together and say, goodness, uh, does it have any relevance today at all? Uh, interestingly, um, uh, there's the first wave of environmentalism. You see oh, precautionary pessimism is happening. And what very key thing, reprimitivization. <coughs> see that in all this stuff. Great love for hatred of sort of advanced high tech, trying to get back to much more basic kind of tech. Uh, gradually that cools down and we began to realise, well, actually, you know, you can't manage it without, without some kind of basic industrial infrastructure. You can't have a an unindustrial society, not possible. Furthermore, all the classical environmental problems, the Friends of the Earth type problems like acid rain and uh, uh, sort of ozone hole, all sorts of other things like that, got solved. Technically, we found we could solve them. Well, okay, we had to say, all right, you can solve those problems. But of course, then we, the, the climate change era kicks in. That's quite different. There's a whole bunch of problems there that behave in a completely different way. So then we had to revise the clock and we sort of say, oh, now we've got to really get on the case, move along. And then finally, in the, the feedback model stuff, we're back down to more precautionary pessimism. And so today, I feel rather like I did in the 70s, rather <laughs> quick, <laughs> having gone through a very relaxed period in the 90s. <laughs> no problem, we've got 50 or 100 years to sort things out. Now we definitely, it's, it's, it is more like 30 years. So just to sort of summarise some of that, I mean, I've got these diagrams of, uh, of how... GDP relates to environmental impacts. This has a bearing on technology. So originally it's like that. Okay, we just sort of say, oh yeah, the economy grows, that's great. So does the environmental impact. Who cares? We all, we all live with it. That's absolutely fine. Interestingly enough, the, um, Marxists were often saying, no, that's only under, under capitalism. Uh, it wouldn't happen under socialism. But of course, in the Soviet Union, we were getting the opposite <laughs> effect, actually. We were getting this. Uh, and you were even getting things like this poster, if you can read Russian, it says... Smoke from factory chimneys, the breath of Soviet Russia. <laughs> yeah, very funny. So you meet, you, you know, Russian bureaucrats at conferences. There are no, no environmental problems in the Soviet Union. Quite right, they weren't. They weren't problems. They regarded them as badges of progress. They loved it. The romance of filth. Of course, that's the opposite of what we were trying to get at. But uh, what, what you were seeing, actually, a lot of it was we were able to get what's called absolute decoupling. Can you see? Well, you're getting a rising GDP and you're getting a lower resource impact. Certainly when you get Moore's Law and all that sort of thing happening, there are lots of bits, plus a lot of exported uh, filth. You know, a lot, of, a lot of stuff is happening in China. And it doesn't appear on our balance sheet. So uh, you're getting a sort of illusion of improve, improvement here. Um, but when you actually look at the, the really big, serious global problems, you're not getting that at all. You're getting an increase in GDP and no improvement, whatever. That is the, in what you might sort of the capitalist choice, or is it just the capitalist choice? This is what happens. You improve technology, 
Do we uh, use it to improve the environment? No, we don't. We just use it to improve functionality. And that's what, one of the things that lies behind our, the evolution of our thinking about that. So when you go back, uh, the 30-year estimate is a literal, that's how much carbon budget is left you know, before things really start to go bad. So uh, there is this great sense of urgency. But what does that mean in terms of the technology? Uh, this is our model, which a lot of people would say is very naive. We are actually trying to pick off the environmental problems one at a time. And so we're using our advancing technology to make the environmental impact better and better and better. Meanwhile, the, t the actual size of the economy might not grow at all, but it improves in quality. And that's the idea. Rather similar to teenagers, if they don't stop growing and start being nicer, we get very upset about it. So that, that principle applied to, to the economy uh, rather than... So that's our idea. That's what we are trying to do. But that is a kind of political uh, idea. And so we're looking for, in a sense, quasi-objective elbows in some of these uh, developmental curves where we could actually say, yes, there's the sweet spot. That's the point. It's not just onwards and upwards forever. So here's an example among very many of uh, GDP against the group genuine progress indicator, which puts all those other bad bits <laughs> in the GDP, puts them all together. And you actually find that the optimum is somewhere around 7,000, 8,000, something like that. So there might be, it's more like Cuba, dare I say it. <laughs> but, um, okay, so now, to say, what does this mean in terms of technology? Does it mean that it's just the politics which is different and we've just given up on any technological differences? I don't think so, but it does require a, a more careful uh, view of it. So for, just to take the example of building that we've been working on at, at CAT, uh, in the left-hand side you've got the pre-industrial state, we, all, all, the, all the materials were low tech, as it were, low carbon, because there was no choice. As the industrial period cuts in, we start using a lot more, yes, steel, concrete, all that sort of thing gradually. And finally, in the mature industrial state, it's nearly all super duper high tech, high performance materials with a little bit of great, you know, I might put some wood cladding or something nice on to make it look a bit funky. All right, that is considered to be that's it, that's, that's the way we're going to go on forever and ever. We've been looking at alternatives and saying, well, hang on a minute. We know we can't go back to the original state. We need lots of what we call industrial vitamins to make things work and be functional. But you don't need a lot, just like in, in food. You don't need a lot of vitamins. You need some. So basically what we're trying to do is develop systems where the great bulk of the material is low-tech or even sort of positive in various ways, negative carbon maybe, and... Uh, so, but you have a little bit of that extra on top. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of uh, approach we're taking now, and uh, it doesn't deny the need for uh, sort of high-tech stuff. And there's an example of a building which has got 80% low-carbon materials and industrial vitamins. Just to finish off, um, lots of people are going to say, <laughs> I mean, I don't know where you find that at all amusing. Um, the funny bit is that there's a serious situation there, and it's urgent. And the offer is something rather pleasant and gentle and mild. And that's most of the criticism that we get is, look, hang on, you know, there's, there's a serious big crisis here. And it's desperate, you know, it's got a, and what are you offering? Aromatherapy. Um, <laughs> so the, the next question, what's happening to us? If you say, we've got 30 years left, what do you do now? This is the sort of thing that's coming out of the woodwork. This emergency mitigation stuff, all the things we hated most nuclear, geoengineering, artificial meat, all this stuff is coming out as, as being necessary, just as you might need to do some pretty violent stuff to that poor chap lying on the pavement. You know, the, the Rome therapy is not good enough. But if we don't do some of this very tough stuff, we get the worst of all worlds, we get the adaptation world, where everybody's given up on climate change, and it's just simply a, w a war of all against all. And then, then all our progressive politics, all our lovely ideas about it might have just completely gone out of the window. That's, so in a sense, that is the demon that's waiting on the corner that we're trying to avoid. And uh, well, we don't have any simple answers, but there we are. Thank you very much.